Hi, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. It's great to see such a great turnout. Uh, welcome to this uh, talk called Listening to Racism or Why Sound Matters um, with Jennifer Stover, uh, who we're very happy to host today. Um, this talk is uh, marking and celebrating the 10th anniversary of Media Communication Studies. exciting time, and um, it's great to see so many students and faculty and staff here uh, for this event. We have another event in April, which will be an alumni uh, a panel, which uh, we'll be sending out information about, also marking the 10th anniversary. Um, but for this talk, I want to thank our sponsors, the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, the Drescher Center for the Humanities. Big shout out to Courtney Hobson, who made it all possible, the Africana Studies Department, and the English Department. Uh, this talk is also part of the Humanities Forum series, um, which uh, is always uh, filled with great events. We have some good ones coming up this spring. Um, I encourage you to take a look at the, uh, uh, the flyer that's uh, outside my door and all over campus, or to look at the Drescher Center website, which is dreschercenter.uobc.edu, uh, to find out about other events that usually happen uh, this time of day at this kind of place. Um, please also engage with the Drescher Center on social media. Uh, you can follow the Drescher Center for the Humanities on Facebook uh, or at, at UMBC Humanities on Twitter. And if you're on Twitter and feel like tweeting to today's uh, event, you can use uh, hashtag humforum18. That's hashtag humforum18. Um, and I, uh, I also invite you to attend the next Humanities Forum event, which is coming up on uh, Thursday, March 8th. Uh, which is going to be at 4 p.m. at the right here, the library gallery, uh, and this is also the um, this event is also the Kornman lecture, which is hosted by uh, Gender and Women's Studies program, um, and this year's uh, Kornman lecture will be given by Deepa Iyer, who is a South Asian American activist, writer, and lawyer, called on becoming on uh, on becoming bridge builders and disruptors, navigating racial and gender realities in America today. America is becoming a nation in which communities of color will comprise the majority population by 2040. In her talk, Deepa Iyer explores the racial realities affecting people of color, women, immigrants, and refugees in America today. It sounds like it's going to be a really great event, so hope to see everyone there. Um, today's speaker, Jennifer Lynn Stover, um, uh, received her PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity at um, USC and is an associate professor of English at SUNY Binghamton, uh, where she teaches courses in African American literature and race and gender representations in popular music. Uh, she's co-founder and editor-in-chief of the uh, Sound, uh, Sounding Out, which is an amazing sound studies blog, which I really recommend to you. And she has published in Social Text, Social Identities, Sound Effects, American Quarterly, Radical History Review, and Modernist Culture, among others. In 2011-2012, she was a fellow at the Society for the Humanities at Cornell University, participating in the research group on sound, culture, theory, politics. She recently published her first book, The Sonic Colorline, Race and the Cultural Politics of Listening. Here's my well-loved copy uh, uh, with uh, NYU Press. And the book's getting a lot of attention, and she's going all over the place talking about it, and we're lucky to have her. Um, and she's currently working on something she told us about at lunch, which sounds really exciting, but uh, I actually started to get a small anxiety attack about how much <laughs> she's trying to do in, in so little time. But if it happens, uh, I want to go and then rip it off and just do, do the same thing, only in Arbutus. Um, but uh, it's, it's going to be this amazing uh, project, a large-scale community sound art project in Binghamton, New York. So. Come for the sound project, stay for the speedies, is what I would say. Uh, and then without further ado, here is uh, Jennifer Stover. Wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for such a warm welcome and for coming out to hear me speak this evening. Thank you so much, Jason, for your kind introduction and for the invitation to be part of your department's anniversary and this very esteemed Humanities Forum Lecture Series. It's been wonderful spending the day with you and your colleagues, and thank you to Earl, Bryce, and Melita for the generous greeting, the great lunchtime conversation. I need to see Black Panther more than one time. What have I been doing with my life in the last week and a half? 
Um, and thank you to Jessica Berman for an excellent interview and intellectual tour of the Drescher Center. And of course, to Courtney Hobson, where are you? Courtney, my goodness, thank you for your planning, your paperwork, and your patience in, in getting me here today. Um, all right, let's get started. Listening to racism in the US or why sound matters. I'm feeling self-conscious because this is so tall and I'm so not tall. I wonder if there's something I could, could do. Um, so I can walk, can I walk with this or no? Yeah. Nope, I gotta stay near here. That's okay. Just in the uh, oh. All right. Okay, now, sorry, folks over there, you're just gonna get to see the a quarter of my face. <clears throat> all right. For a very long time now, America has audaciously and impossibly labored under the illusion that it is a colorblind nation, that skin color simply doesn't matter when it comes to employment or schooling or opportunity of any sort, that it is possible or you know desirable to not see color when it comes to intimate relationships, to hiring or firing, to renting a home, to buying a home, to policing a neighborhood. And more cynically, that in a market-driven nation, right, in our nation, it's, it's only, not only is it possible and profitable, it's best, right, when everyone sees only green, the color of dollars earned toward that American dream, open to all, equally, provided, of course, you can afford it. Even now, when white supremacists amass openly in college towns such as Charlottesville and receive invitations to speak on campuses such as the University of Chicago, and of course among many other acts I could name here, but I only have an hour, the current president openly states his preference for white Northern European immigrants over men and women of color from, and of course here are his infamous exact words, shithole countries. He could still stand on stage with a straight face just two days later and insist that he was the least racist person that the press has ever interviewed. Even with such an obviously racist sentiment still lingering in the Twittersphere, White House Press Secretary Sanders could use the term colorblind the same day to reinforce that the current administration's proposed immigration policy could not be considered racist because, and this is her phrase, by definition, a merit-based system is colorblind. By definition, it erases all of those things. Even in the face of obvious and glaring evidence of American racism, the term colorblind is so entrenched, it still has force, as if repetition alone has made it true as if racism enacted under its banner, or even in its name, what sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva calls racism without racists, or colorblind racism, simply doesn't exist. How can this be, right? How has racism continued to, first, how has racism continued to proliferate if this nation is so colorblind, while its perpetrators can insist with all seriousness that racism has been vanquished, right? All of its things erased. How have we gotten here? Um, this came out shortly after last year, shortly after the, the, uh, the election. And this is kind of, you know, the kind of mood, hashtag mood of, my, of the talk here, right? But I'm opening talking about, I wrote a book about colorblind racism, but um, I'm, more, I'm more me this semester. I'm here tonight to discuss exactly this, right? The radical gap in perception regarding racism in the United States. In the time we share this evening, I'll explain the findings of my research on race, sound, and listening, and show how it helps us understand how such radically different perceptions of the persistence of race and races in the US can exist simultaneously, right? We, we all had those friends who were like, how did we, you know, how did this happen so suddenly? And I'm like, it's, it was there the whole time. Um, and that's exactly what my book's about. Um, in what follows, I argue that the only way colorblindness could have ever taken root as a functioning ideology in a nation so riven with unrepaired and deeply historical racial hierarchies is because we hear America's color line as well as we, as we see it, maybe even more so in a nation so stubbornly insistent that it is possible or even desirable for everyone to suddenly overlook race. My goal tonight is to unsettle the exclusive relationship with race and looking that colorblind racism depends upon. First, by introducing the concept of the sonic color line, which is the title of my 2016 book, um, And Way You Press. And it's my term for the racial boundaries anyone who grows up or spends much time in this country is socialized to hear and to amplify. Then we will use this concept to listen to racism in the US, showing why sound matters in our contemporary struggles against racism, 
systematically in our everyday interactions in public spaces. By identifying the sonic color line, I believe we can work to shift our historically and culturally attuned listening practices toward a more equitable world today. The Sonic Color Line, the book, traces in great historical detail how the Sonic Color Line, the racial ideology, developed in the 19th century and became deeply rooted in American culture and institutions. How it impacted and transformed itself alongside 100 years of major racial shifts, the Civil War, Reconstruction, the Great Depression and the Great Migration, and World War II. It also details how black writers, artists, and people have mapped, challenged, and shifted this boundary since the time of its creation. So what is the sonic color line, and why is it something that we all need to know? At its most basic, the sonic color line is a term that enables us to talk about how racism is enacted through sound and listening. Right? It's really naming a phenomenon that, that we, are, we are all familiar with, but putting a name to it, connecting um, incidents of sonic racism. It names the process that enables us to label and hear each other as black, white, brown, Asian, indigenous. And it allows us to do this without any overt reference to visual codes of race. All of those familiar markers, skin color, hair texture, facial features, all those familiar markers that the biological sciences have long debunked as indicative of anything essential, and that colorblindness right, has supposedly removed, erased from our laws and our lives. And because we rarely talk about listening in general, the sonic color line unfortunately works quite effectively as a form of racial profiling and discrimination in a society that has right, allegedly legally outlawed that. White people in particular are socialized into perpetual ignorance of the sonic color line's existence, even as, especially as, they enacted and profit from it, ensuring racism will continue to renew and perpetuate itself through the medium of sound. Before I get into the specific content of the sonic color line, the voices, music, and sounds that have become racially coded in the US, I want to briefly explain how it has come to create and exploit this, this blind spot about race and perception, and detail a little of the history of how and why white elites gave rise to the sonic color line in the period just before the Civil War. An important first question, why don't we have the same language to talk about listening that we do about seeing? Despite the multi-sensory nature of our experience of the world around us, Western culture has long privileged the sense of sight as the most important, the most valuable, the most advanced, right? Connected to truth, indicative of reason, and expressive of power. Think about the perspective provided by a panoramic view, for example, or a map of the globe. Black studies scholar Fred Moten describes our society as indelibly marked by what he calls an overdetermined politics of looking. Music scholars Michael Bull and Les Back have dub dubbed it a culture that thinks with the eyes. Or at least we think we do, right? That's what I say. Which really matters. Perception has a large hand in shaping reality, something the sonic color line depends upon to do its work. The idiomatic language and cultural metaphors of American English deeply reflect this visual bias. See what I did there? I reflect, just slip that one right in. Um, we use the symbol of light, what the eye perceives when we want to refer to knowledge and learning. We illuminate points. We have labeled a period in our history the Enlightenment, despite this period also giving rise to racism and the global slave trade depended upon it. Despite Photoshop, we insist that seeing is believing, that vision provides an immediate clarity. We see the handwriting on the wall. We invest a single picture with the worth of a thousand words, and we claim that it's all there in black and white. We insist we need to lay or feast our eyes on something in order to prove its existence. We tell others that they won't believe their eyes to indicate that they really should. When we want to discuss ignorance, we use the metaphor of darkness, right? The dark ages to retroactively name the period before the enlightenment or the thing in Wrinkle in Time. I'm curious to see how that's going to go down with Ava DuVernay. Um, that's been difficult reading that book and knowing the kind of investment in darkness that the original book has. Um, we use the very ableist saying, the blind leading the blind to express ignorance. The slogan of the University of California system, of which I'm a product, UC Riverside, um, fiat lux or let there be light. It very neatly brings together the enlightenment belief in the power 
and knowledge of the I with a Christian cosmology that only marks the start of the world with light, even though in the beginning there was the word. These are the equations, light equals reason, dark equals ignorance, that European colonizers, conquistadors, and slavers mapped onto the darker bodies they encountered in their imperialist ventures, creating the concept and visual language of race to justify them. In contrast, the Western tradition casts listening as an unreliable sense, too worldly, too bodily, too interior and emotional to be trusted on its own. Think of how our court system privileges eyewitnesses, for example, but largely considers hearsay inadmissible. However, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the auditory sciences suddenly made sound more visible and material as vibrations. The tuning fork was invented in 1711, um, actually by a trumpet player. Um, that's, uh, those are from the Smithsonian there. Those are tuning forks attached to a reson resonators to amplify the sound. <clears throat> Italian anatomist Alfonso Corti mapped the inner ear in 1851. That's the area where the tiny hairs called stereocilia transduce and amplify the waves that enter the ear canal. And German physicist Hermann von Helmholtz published on the sensation of tone in 1863, where he detailed his experiments with various resonators that led him to theorize about what he called timbre, the unique but somewhat ineffable quality that listeners distinguish, but use to distinguish between the same notes, right? A C on the piano is the same note as on a violin, but yet they have this different quality when we hear it. Acquiring a visual aspect, right? What these things all did around this time was allow sound and the vibrations of sound, which are material. You are all being touched. If you can hear my voice, you are all being touched by it um, in this particular moment. It's material, it's tangible. It gave it a visual aspect. You could see the vibrations on the tuning fork. Um, you could see the layout of the inner ear. And Corti was actually such a segregationist. He wanted to like, he wanted to, on his map, he thought that each hair correlated to a different sound out in the world that was attuned to pick it up. Um, and a lot of these scientists were also classical musicians. So the kind of theory behind European music is built into these scientific models and discoveries. Acquiring a visual aspect, sound suddenly became much more credible. However, this new relationship to touch um, waves tangibly allowed bodies to reach out and touch each other at, at a distance, as composer and voice scholar Yvonne Bonenfant so eloquently puts it. It made sound seem much more dangerous because it's so direct and visceral. It's a sense now in need, according to the white elites, right, of some kind of boundary and control that correlated with the religious, social, racial, class, and gendered hierarchies that strictly enforced and regulated touch and proximity in the 19th century. So white elite thinkers found it necessary to take this unruly, emotive, and uncomfortably tangible sense in hand, creating elite and discernible modes of speaking, being, and listening that provided them with, in their eyes, a socially acceptable and audible range of sounds associated with dispassionate rationality that would orally communicate and inhabit their status. White elites then drew the sonic color line as a way to control the dangerous potential of cross-racial aural traffic by providing whites with an aural etiquette of disciplined interpretations, hierarchies, and allegedly clear racial distinctions for incoming vibrations. So part of this process entailed identifying whiteness and maleness as something more than skin deep. Sound could now audibly signify a mode of bodily comportment it could signal one's adherence to a white way of being and feeling and becoming explicitly recognized as an important new method of taking in the world and externalizing white supremacy as a means of sensory control over the world. Far from being invisible, as we so often claim about whiteness when we think of how white people perceive it as a visual norm, whiteness became an audible way of animating one's body and a sensory orientation to the world itself Racializing sound allowed whiteness to become a, an emotional affect, a thing that could be felt. Um, here is a famous image. Just, um, Eric Lott talks about this in his In Love and Theft. And I look at it and think about it, right? You can see, um, you can hear this, this picture. 
even though it is, it is ostensibly silent. This is the minstrel performers, the Virginia Serenaders, and you see each man in their you know, white uniform, in their white drag, and then you see them performing. Um, those are their counterparts when they're on stage, then performing the sound and the look, the look of, of blackness. And minstrelsy was one of the ways that this idea of blackness was, was created. Also one of the ways, right, that this idea of white sound and whiteness was created. Some of the differences, right, notice that everyone on the bottom has their mouth closed um, and, and has this, again, this, this animation of the body. Every, every hand is accounted for and posed, um, contrasting with the, the, the very quote unquote noisy look of the top with all of the musicians, arms out, akimbo, legs spread, kind of a very hypersexual, sitting down in a hierarchical relationship. Um, I think this image like reveals too much, like you could see, it, to me it looks like, right, these men have clearly sprung out of the imagination of these folks, these folks down at the bottom. But this is precisely um, um, one of the, the first boundaries of the sonic color line. So minstrelsy provided one experience that trained white audiences to hear explicitly as white people, but simultaneously, right, as Americans and just people, while overtly shaping the antebellum content of, of black sounds and normalizing the American listening ear across class boundaries. The sonic color line also crosses class boundaries. Minstrelsy was an entertainment that was predominantly northern before the Civil War, performed by Jewish and Irish immigrants and white working class men for a mixed class group of audience. At the same time, the notion of race as an easily detected and defined visible entity was becoming more and more unstable in a volatile US careening into the Civil War. Generations of rape by white slave masters had resulted in a large population of light-skinned enslaved peoples, challenging the visibility of blackness. And the Fugitive Slave Law passed in 1850 essentially turned the entire white population of the US into slave hunters, whether they wanted to be or not. This law threw the visibility of blackness into question in a different way. How could the freedom-seeking enslaved people be detected, particularly if attempting to pass as white or trying to blend into existing free black communities? Because there was not much to be done to identify slaves by sight alone, other socially constructed sensory indicators of racial identity became salient, especially culturally identified markers of slavery that began to appear in the advertisements. Um, and the advertisements ran regarding runaways, slow speech, accent, dialect, stuttering. Hang on, I thought I had a slide of this. I do, I just put it in the wrong spot. So these are a couple runaway, runaway slave ads. Um, the University of North Carolina has a great digital archive of, of, of slave narratives and also of these slave ads. And I tried to, to uh, bring a magnifying glass on the use of fine voice as a description in the image on your left. And hoarse voice, Oop, that's coming up, sorry. Um, and a hoarse voice as one of the descriptors in the, the runaway slave ad on the right. A keyword search of the University of North Carolina's digital archive of runaway slave ads reveals the ubiquity of such descriptions, with hoarse voice first appearing in 1777 and fine voice in 1783, um, right at either, either too little or too much, with a sharp increase of voice descriptions in 1811 that steadily rises throughout the 1830s and 1840s. Other key descriptors I found included loud, manly, strong, and or whiny. Sonic effects amplifying the gendered binary of race for black men as simultaneously hyper-masculinized and or feminized in relation to white masculinity, which you saw in the, in the minstrelsy diagram. So these are all markers located slavery firmly, essentially, and invisibly within the bodies of the enslaved. And importantly, and also, of course, not in the economic and political institution that actually produced, conditioned, brutally enforced, and daily demanded displays of these, um, of these differences. Doing so accomplished three things of lasting consequence that we're still wrestling with in our current moment. One, the sonic color line enabled whites to locate sonic difference. 
as you saw in the runaway slave ads, it's often cast as loudness or noise to, to locate difference within the black body, whether visibly black or not. Marking blackness as dangerous and, and a problematic excess of sound at the bottom end of a polar hierarchy with whiteness. Again, that minstrelsy diagram. Two, the sonic color line allowed white people to experience themselves as white, attaching a visceral bodily feeling and emotional experience to this abstract idea called whiteness. By sounding and listening together and attaching similar interpretations, reactions, and values to sound. And three, the sonic color line placed white listeners and their particular tastes, desires, standards, and repulsions, right? It universalized those as, as simply human and placed them at the invisible center of US life, both as a sonic norm, right? Their taste was equated with Americanness and humanness writ large, but also as the arbiter of the sonic color line of what, what was proper, standard, uh, appropriate, etc. Right, setting the stage for, um, you know, the, how many spaces are produced in this country. So therefore, with an immeasurably large scholarly debt, W. E. B. Du Bois who bravely and accurately predicted in 1903 that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the, sonic, uh, is the problem of the color line, I offer the sonic color line as a term to help us better identify and more fully understand racism in the 21st century in order to eradicate it. The sonic color line is my way to name the unspoken racial etiquette we learned growing up and living in America that produces codes and enforces the notion of racial difference through listening. It enables us to hear race as well as see it. The sonic color line creates and solidifies racial stereotypes and links them arbitrarily to the bodies of people of color. For example, right, here's a few that most of us are, are already familiar with. The loud Latino, the quiet Asian, the noisy black person, and then disciplines the white American listening ear to perceive these qualities as foreign, negative, deviant, diminished ways of being that must be eradicated, silenced. The sonic color line is one means through which racism and discrimination can proliferate without ever being officially recognized as such. The sonic color line operates as a still socially acceptable coded racial shorthand out there doing the work of racial discrimination and profiling in plain sight, particularly in three key areas I'm gonna focus on today, um, voice, music, and, and soundscape or ambient sound. In terms of voice, Think of how the sonic color line impacts our perceptions of volume. Whose voice is too loud or too soft? Whose voice is just right? Timbre, right? The, the idea that different races have a discernibly different sound to their voices that is, that is biological rather than cultural, that hoarseness and fineness of those runaway slave ads. And pitch. Here, think about the cultural assumption that black men must have deep voices and black women have masculine sounding voices. And at the same time, think about how such a deep voice has become entangled in the extremely toxic and frequently deadly mythology of black hypermasculinity. The automatic threat American poli police perceive when they, when they see and hear a black male body. The way in which the sonic color line racializes and demonizes the black voice in particular, and African American vernacular English as well, is humorous, humorously but quite seriously addressed by Keegan Michael Key and Jordan Peele in this short sketch that they used as a trailer in advance of the first season of their show, Key and Peele, in 2012, which would launch the largest debut the network had in years, right? Primarily among its primary audience, men between the ages of 18 and 34. All right, let me. This should come up. Because you're my wife and you love the theater. Oh, hang on. And uh, it's your birthday. <laughs> Although it would be kind of cool to be like, let's just listen to the audio. Um, <laughs> I actually do intend to. Hang on. Right. Pause. Right click to get controls. Right. Two oh, fun. <laughs> I need to, there. I got it. Because 
because you're my wife and you love the theater and uh, it's your birthday. <laughs> Great. Un un unfortunately, the, um, the orchestra is already filled up, but they do have seats that are still left in the dress circle, so if you want to um, need to get them theater tickets right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Dawn, about five minutes away. Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. No, they're all good singers. They're all good singers. Yeah, son. Mm -hmm. Nah, man, I'm about to, I'm telling you, man, I'm about to cross the street. Nah, they got that one dude in it that you love, man. He gonna be in it, yeah. Come on, man, you know I'm almost there, there, all right? Right, no, I'm gonna pick your ass up at 6.30. Cool. cool. I'm like, yeah, 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 the parking is, uh, the parking is free. So they got that Oh, my God, Christian, I almost totally just got mugged right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, let me get back to, yeah. All right, in just 44 seconds, right? So much is going on there. Key and Peele code switch across a spectrum of vocal inflections that carry raised meanings, class meanings, gendered meanings, intersecting with notions of normative sexuality as well, pointing out the instability of voice as any kind of authentic identifier of any of these, um, these identities, while pointing out the, yet the very real presence of racist conception of hetero black street masculinity transmitted via sound, and the material consequences of internalizing the sonic color line's racial yardstick. Again, kind of shouting out to two boys there. Um, even as it also calls attention to how queer people must often mask their voices to avoid the everyday violence of, of homophobic culture. Trans scholar Art Blake calls this mode of speaking the gas station voice the kind of voice he takes on when he worries he might not make it out of the men's room at a gas station alive. Well, both men in the sketch imagine that they are granted momentary safe passage by utilizing the sound of the very same stereotype that they have both been socialized to fear and or respect or consider black enough, right, is ultimately a missed opportunity for connection, a fraudulent encounter that only affirms the realness of the sonic color line for these two men and for all of us who laugh with a painful recognition. Music is another cultural arena heavily, con heavily conjured by the sonic color line in the US. And this is perhaps the one we're most familiar with and, and titillated by, I mean, if you consider like the success of Post Malone, for example, um, particularly in the way that the question of, is this noise or is this music, how that always seems to crop up in white mainstream discourse about music performed by black and brown people. Noise that all sounds the same, like many current descriptions of trap music that both dismiss it and exoticize it at the same time, marking it as devoid of meaning and not worthy of any serious attention. Also, black and brown voices and music deem noise, um, judged out of place in the American cultural mainstream, always already perceived as louder than necessary, intrusive. Ideas about volume are a consideration here too. A sound artist and documentarian, Tony Schwartz, once argued, noise is an editorial word. When you talk about noise, you're talking about sound that is bothering you. There's no party so noisy as the one you're not invited to. The sound of hip hop coming through car speakers, for example, has long been a stand in for the bodies of young black men in American culture. Um, and this is, I'm going to use the, there's a group in Rochester called the Rochester Soundscape Society and I attended, I guess undercover, I attended one of their meetings when I was studying at the Frederick Douglass Institute. And this is a meeting also, this is by no means a fringe group, the meeting was attended by the, the chief of police. And um, the press release that they used um, in their campaign was that they were going to quote, tame the boom car monster. Um, again, think about the way that that's coded racial language that doesn't use any visual language of race. Um, they were leading a campaign against boom cars that they described as stealing precious quiet moments from the city's classical music tradition. Noise ordinances then allow for racial profiling without ever explicitly mentioning race. Finally, the sonic color line enables racialized assumptions about musical genre to become gospel truth an indelible aspect of identity rather than culturally shaped taste. And although white artists are allowed and often richly rewarded for cultural competency across the sonic color line, your Elvis, your Eminem, your Iggy Azalea, your Post Malone, black and brown artists and listeners are straitjacketed by stereotypical assumptions li um, linking skin color and genre. Black listeners have had to create social movements to make the complexity and diversity of their music taste audible. 
The Black Rock Coalition was founded in the 1990s by a consortium of black musicians, including Vernon Reed from Living Color. Afropunk, now a successful culture blog and music festival, started out as a documentary in 2003 by James Spooner to amplify the presence and experiences of black punks in a scene perpetually viewed as white, despite the participation of black and brown musicians from the movement's beginnings. Uh, as Brianna Younger described in a recent piece for Pitchfork called Black Musicians on Being Boxed In by R&B and Rap Expectations, Frank Ocean knows the frustration of being creatively pigeonholed by the color of his skin. If you're a singer and you're black, you're an R&B artist, period, he told The Quietest back in 2011. FKA Twigs also understands this feeling. When I first released music and no one knew what I looked like, I would read comments like, I've never heard anything like this before. It's not a genre, she told The Guardian in 2014. And then my picture came out six months later. Now she's an R&B singer. And I have, I have seen this happen. This happened to Lena Horn in the 40s, and it's still happening. When the sonic color line's impact on voice and music connects the sound of race to the visuality of bodies, and attempts to lock in and solidify this link, right? To deem it permanent, irrefutable, unchangeable evidence of white supremacy and racial hierarchy. The sonic color line also shapes and is shaped by ideas of what's called the soundscape or the, the, the sounds that, background sounds that are present in a scene or location to make up a place. Think of how we associate the clang and rumble of urban life versus suburban peace and quiet, for instance. And Kim Peel have many sketches on, on sound in those spaces as well. Um, the sonic color line disciplines American listeners to understand and experience certain places and spaces as essentially and sometimes naturally black, white, brown, etc., even in the absence of the visual presence of bodies. Think about, so there's great work by Laura Polito on what she calls environmental racism and how factories and, and things get placed in neighborhoods of people of color both because of the cheapness of the land, which is a whole other aspect of, of racism through redlining, et cetera, the lack of advocacy and the lack of funding to protest, but also this idea that it's okay, right? Brown people are noisy, they won't, you know, they, and the, 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 the way in which that legend grows up to justify such placements. <clears throat> Hang on, let me get to, yeah. <clears throat> so the sonic color line disciplines American listeners to understand that places have a, a race. The sonic color line locates voice and music in space, determines the sonic protocol in a place, and tells us what kinds of sounding and listening are to be enacted there. And often what sensory experiences are to be denied, silenced, suppressed, ridiculed, banished, or tuned out. I just read a great book by Push Out that's all about black women in schools and how um, our, our teaching force is 82% white women and, and how black girls are often punished for asking questions. And the act of being able to break silence and ask a question is increasingly becoming criminalized for, for black girls. Touching back on the Key and Peel sketch, we might also argue that it is the urban location that prompted the two men to take on voices they recognize as black, masculine, vernacular, and street. The urban operates as a racial shorthand in the same way as noisy, loud, and deep voice does. That had they bumped into each other at a Starbucks, perhaps, or on a ski lift, they might have taken a different sonic tack with one another, one that would not have offered up the black masculine vernacular voice as fearful, intimidating, and singular, right, the voice, at home only on the proverbial street corner. However, even as spaces like the Starbucks offer themselves up as colorblind, free, neutral, and equal, provided that in a capitalist society one can afford the price of a latte or admission, the unspoken norms of the sonic color line operate to place as a, a student of Ithaca College professor Nina Nunn Makepeace described as invisible flashing whites only signs everywhere. Particularly when presented as human universals, just as things are or the way they should be for everyone, rather than acknowledged as the situational sensory particularities they often are, norms about sound can enforce racial hierarchies and alienate people of color creating segregated space without white people ever employing the visual language of race at all. For example, here's a real contemporary, um, so I think so contemporary, it's just a couple of weeks old, 
of the Sonic Color Line operating in the rapidly gentrifying Echo Park neighborhood of Los Angeles from the first episode of the recently released second season of the Netflix reboot of the Norman Lear sitcom One Day at a Time. Please watch it, it's great. Um, it features Justina Machado as Lupe, a single Cuban-American woman raising her two children in Echo Park with the help of her mother Lydia, played by Rita Moreno, and the friendship of her neighbor, neighbor handyman landlord Schneider, now revisioned as a privileged white gentrifying Canadian by Todd Grinnell. <laughs> Echo Park, a once predominantly Latino neighborhood near Dodger Stadium, which was also a Latino neighborhood called Chavez Ravine that was bulldozed um, about a few years before Dodger Stadium was built, associated primarily with violence and gangs in the US national imaginary as late as 1990s, um, the film Echo Park especially, has become ground zero in the battles over gentrification in Los Angeles. As one recently displaced resident, Rocio Sanchez, told the LA Times in 2015, in the 90s, people wouldn't even walk their dogs down the street because of concerns about crime. But now the Times calls Echo Park a destination community with a million dollar homes, with million dollar homes. And now most long-term residents can no longer afford to stay there. But as one day at a time definitely represents, People of color who can afford Echo Park's rising rents often face racism and disorienting displacement via their new predominantly but not entirely white middle class neighbors sensory regime, replacing once familiar and inviting soundscapes um, with places with new norms that mark residents like, um, like Lupe's family as too loud, too much, perpetually foreign, despite having lived there much, much longer. This scene here comes at the end of an episode that's focused on, it's called The Turn, um, and it's, a, it's kind of a trick. Sorry for the spoilers, but there's so many more good things about this show. Um, the scene comes at the end of an episode focused on the resurgence of white nationalism in the US since the election of our current president. After Lupe's son, or the current president, I should say, after Lupe's son lashes out at his family for cheering him on in Spanish at his baseball game, they just assume he's becoming a teenager, right? That the turn is like, okay, he's, he's going through it. Um, he's, he's, he's wants to break out on his own. He's embarrassed of his family. Um, but hurtful but normal acting out. However, it comes to light that Alex has been facing relentless taunts to go back to Mexico for speaking Spanish in school, and he's been made to feel ashamed. The family discusses the race, racist resurgence with him, contextualizing Alex's experiences with earlier moments of anti-Latino racism in US history. Rita Moreno's character Lydia recounts whites calling her spick in the 1950s, which is a sonic term of racism that res refers pejoratively to Spanish inflected English. I can't spick English is supposedly where that term comes from. So sound as a, as a racial epithet. Comforting him as they come up with strategies to help him challenge and survive it. While they can't offer Alex a happy ending, they try to give him an American one, a trip to the new hipster locally sourced ice cream shop Game of Cones. <laughs> now you'll notice on the sign, today's flavor is green fennel and maple. Um, let's see, let's see what happens. Okay, hang on. <laughs> um, all right, so let me go to the... Actually, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. There is one thing that completely stops the effects of racism. You're right, Mom. I feel only peace. Alex, you have something on your Jane. You need a Latinx. <laughs> That's a long-running gag in the in the where um, the daughter's trying to explain to her grandmother um, why she uses Latinx, and Rita Moreno constantly jokes around. Ah, Elena, but did you get it, No. Yes. But I was able to do my whole order in Spanish. Dale, blanquita, dale. Dale, blanquita, dale. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Excuse me. 
I know you're having a little fiesta over here, but you should really learn to keep your voice down. There are other people in here. Mommy, would you hold my hand, please? <laughs> I'm the lady from the table over there, and I am the lady's mother, not her sister. <laughs> Question, are you the owner of this establishment? No. So then you must know that we have just as much a right to be here as you. You were being very loud. Yeah, I noticed you used the word fiesta. Would you care to comment on that? More choice of words. Yes, I agree. Yeah. yeah, it was a very poor choice of words. And you know what else was a poor choice of words? All the other words you said to me and my family. Because this isn't a library. And we're over there having a nice time. But for some reason, you decided that meant I was all, ah, riva, riva, riva. That's not me. How dare you, Estelios? <laughs> I was born right here, in this country. I'm an American. Cuban American. And we come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Mostly white. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes we can be a little racist, too which is why we should all be free to enjoy the rich diversity of this great nation. Now you and your wife have a good night. Still think you should keep your voice down? That's all I'm saying. Yeah, well, agree to disagree, sir! <laughs> that was awesome, Mom. You see, if you get angry, they win. If you never get angry, they also win. It's complicated. <laughs> the point is, I didn't hit anybody, and we all got ice cream. All right, let's get out of here. Thank you. And if anybody else wants to know what's up, this Latin American family is headed to their American home. That is so cool. Anne Hathaway just totally stood up for this next time. <laughs> 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 Chicana Studies media scholar Inez Casillas calls performances such as Lupe's assertion of Spanglish in the face of the man's racist assault on what he perceives as the family's loudness, right, hold my helado, Lydia's deliberately exaggerated rolling of her R's, and the quieter but still, we're not going to let you tell us how we should sound, ballet chant, which translates as an endearing celebratory, like, you go, Lupita, a full circle reference. That was the chant that they, they were using at the beginning of the episode to Alex that he was embarrassed by. Um, she calls it listening loudly as her, in her work on Spanish language radio listeners, an important practice of soundscape resistance that Latinx peoples enact in the face of sonic racism. Casillas argues that acts such as, quote, raising the volume on Spanish language radio sends neighbors a racialized sign, um, and she writes about Mexican Americans in particular, a racialized signs of Mexicanness often heard as unruly, noisy, and perhaps worse, unassimilated. High volume from the private spaces of homes and cars disrupts the quiet public acceptance of earbuds while also providing sheer public glee. An audible, unabashed reminder of other forms of lo sucio, high credit card debt, more than 2.2 children, vegetable gardens in the front yards, too much cologne or Virgen, Virgen de Guadalupe ornaments, and the brown refusal to tone, much less to turn it down." End quote. What's especially dangerous about the sonic color line in our contemporary moment, you notice they repeated American an awful lot in the episode, is a way that it allows whiteness to become even more firmly attached to American citizenship. Because, because unspoken racialized norms about sound exist and circulate through American culture. Members of the dominant groups may use sound with impunity to forge reasonable suspicion about the citizen, citizenship status of anyone who sounds different from them and who creates, consumes, and appreciates sounds differently from them. Certainly the sound of Spanish is at the top of the list, even though the United States does not have an official language. I say that over and over. States such as Arizona have enacted multiple strident English-only laws. Beyond the sound of Spanish itself, there's a sound of accent in English. And as Stanford sociologist John Baugh's work on linguistic profiling bears out, accents can have an extreme impact on economic chances in the US, as well as one's sense of belonging. 
Now accents, the sound of Spanish language radio emanating from one's workplace, may decide whether or not one gets hassled for their papers and detained, and if not, um, if not a citizen or a legal resident, or even right now, legal residents deported. As my media examples have shown, sound matters greatly in terms of creating and maintaining equitable and truly shared public spaces that offer equal access and freedom of expression, rather than just the visual appearance of colorblindness, right, when you walk into the game of cones, coupled with the sonic color line status quo. All too often, the sonic color line creates situations compelling people of color to police themselves in order to gain entry to white spaces, and all too often to make it out healthy, whole, and alive. A real-life example of how the sonic color line I touch on briefly in my book in the afterword shows the sonic color, line, con, con, sonic color line as a term that links voice, music, and soundscape. And um, so in upstate New York, where I live, um, and where I work, the town Binghamton, New York, there's a bar called Dillinger's that markets itself as a Celtic pub and eatery, complete with shamrock. Um, they use the sonic code line to police voice and music, imposing a racially inflected control of the soundscape that deliberately created hostile and unequal public space. For years, two signs hung in this bar that both reference and enforce the sonic color line. Two signs that if their content and intent were translated into visual references of race, they would have been, I'd like to think, removed immediately and, you know, and actionable as aggravated assault. But not so these sonic signs. Um, the first drew a sonic color line in reference to speech and accent, declaring no bro or yo spoken here. Bro and yo, of course, operating as shorthand referencing African American vernacular English long discriminated against as a substandard or incorrect way of speaking, despite the fact that linguists have identified it many years ago as its own complex language variant with its own grammatical rules. The second sign at Dillinger's made reference to music, declaring that hip hop will not be played on the dance floor, specifically discriminating against an art form developing from black and Puerto Rican urban cultures. Even if these signs did not forcibly exclude black and brown bodies, they certainly created an atmosphere of hostility one that communicated to AAVE speakers that white ways of listening, being, and speaking. I remember back again that minstrel, that image of control. Culturally coded as proper, controlled this space, and that one must accept and abide by the sonic color line and police oneself for signs of deviation to exist here. Perhaps most insidiously, these signs make audible how the sonic color line fractions American simultaneous experiences of the same spaces. It enables segregation via sonic protocol as we live, work, study, and raise children side by side in fractured, unequal spaces that are made to appear open and equitable for everyone. By evoking the racialized hierarchy of speech sounds, the signs created an inherently unequal and dangerous place for black patrons, one where the doorman might arbitrarily deny you entry, the doorman slash owner might arbitrarily deny you entry, slam you to the ground, and call you the N-word, as happened to 21-year-old resident Kyle Lovett Pitts on August 25, 2013, sparking protests by Binghamton students and residents that ultimately got these signs taken down for good. Sound mattered here, both in terms of how the ostensibly colorblind bar excluded black and brown patrons, patrons, as well as in the noise we made in the streets to exercise our agency in the face of this racism and to raise awareness of audible racism happening in plain sight. And that's the sound I want to leave you with this evening, the sound of silence breaking, the sound of agency and dissent. It's my fondest wish that the examples of black agency and decolonizing practices in the face of racism through soundscape control remind us that the sonic color line creates the very conditions for its undoing. University students all over the country, Binghamton, University of Mississippi, Ithaca College, Yale, Tufts, Princeton, Brown, Claremont McKenna, are challenging the institutional racism of American higher education and their respective institutions' wholesale refusal to do anything about it or even listen to the demands and concerns of students of color, all the while lauding diversity, inclusion, and yes, colorblindness. These students, in unity with protesters in Ferguson, Staten Island, Baltimore, and many other US cities are sounding the most recent crisis erupting from a long-standing form of sonic white supremacy. Some protests have mobilized silent die-ins, while others have wielded a wide spectrum of sound, bullhorn call and response chants, shouts, screams, YouTube videos, well-timed questions to demand new relations of speaking and listening, particularly the right to listen freely to themselves 
and as themselves. But I want to emphasize that the sound of these young voices, however powerful, cannot bear the burden and should not do all of the work. The outcry of protest demands we notice, observe, and actively work to dismantle our colorblind spots and shift our listening practice in our everyday lives toward race-conscious listening. I'll leave you with three small sonic changes that can have a large impact, things you can begin doing today, right now, as you walk out of here, that will go a long way toward disrupting the many compounded microaggressions that comprise the sonic color line. One, say names. Say names as right as you possibly can. Sound them out. Take the time. Repeat them with respect and without humor and self-deprecation. Don't pause too long before a name that seems unfamiliar. Don't point out how you can't pronounce it. Just try and try and try. Never laugh at names. Names come from our communities, our people, our traditions, often the people we love most in the world. The first day of school, graduation, all are key times when people of color are pointed at microaggressions that show people of color that they, that they don't belong. Second, become accent and dialect literate. If you're a monolingual English speaker in America, rather than scrutinizing how well everyone can speak American or not, I don't know if you saw the YouTube, the teacher from New Jersey who told um, her students who were speaking Spanish to speak American. <clears throat> Focus on whether or not your ear can accurately and sensitively hear English spoken with multiple cultural, national, regional, and linguistic inflections. Rather than centralizing you as the arbiter of belonging, consciously work from the assumption that it's your listening practice that's deficient, not the speaker's expression. See how that impacts your thought process and understanding. Look at each encounter as an opportunity to listen out thoughtfully to speakers that you perceive have an accent. You have one too. Gaining fluency in how English sounds when spoken by a native Hindi speaker, for example, a French Canadian. And three, be aware of and counter racial surprise in yourself and others. And I have that cartoon up there. One of my colleagues posted that. Um, and that's a great example of, of racial, racial surprise, right? You don't look Hispanic. Um, oh, I'm sorry, let me just, and the performative aspect, right? The surprise of you don't look, you don't sound Hispanic. <clears throat> so, this feeling of shock we're supposed to have and display when sonic boundaries are crossed, when voices don't match bodies, when we don't sound black or white or Latino, when we have musical tastes we aren't supposed to have, this racial surprise fuels the sonic color line and keeps it firmly in place. The difficult, necessary work of decolonizing listening and dismantling racist sonic architecture will take much time, awareness, discomfort, and steady, conscious, meticulous effort in those everyday moments. Those, those matter so much. In the long tradition of the trope of the listener, may we challenge, multiply, and amplify our listening in order that we, paraphrasing Ice Cube, check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. May we also offer one another something more and something better, an ethics of listening where we all, at long last, as Frederick Douglass imagined, become witnesses and participants, hearing beyond the narrowed lives racialized listening has wrought, able to, at long last, listen out to and for one another, freely responding to the vibrational call of older ways of knowing too long silenced while attuning ourselves to the new world a coming. Thank you very much. So we have time for some <coughs> questions if people have them. Um, do you want to point to people who Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Let's jump right in. Um, I have a I read some of the book. Um, awesome. Was a Thank you very much. Yeah, there, there's a juxtaposition uh, that I'm not quite making sense. First of all, there's a block quote from a black radio performer at the turn of the century talking about. Let me about get mine too. Hang on. <laughs> oh, I got Page mine too. Mine is very. I had to highlight my own book. <laughs> there's a lot in there. I got to. Okay, 244. Where, where he's, he's talking about variation as value. Yes. Block quote begins, we have phrases, idioms, that is speech habits, etc., that are ours. I can't explain, but there is something distinctive about most Negro speech technique. A lot of us are trying to throw away a quality that the white man is picking up and using. 
All races have certain similarities of voice and speech qualities. We are normal individuals and should not be made ashamed of our most distinguishing assets, end quote. Then on the next page, you bring up how another, uh, I believe it was a writer, he was writing about contemporary black radio. He interrogates the assertions of white radio executives that black actors' voices possess an undeniably recognizable tone and that for black actors, voices much, excuse me, voices must, quote, match bodies. So it seems like, I'm, I'm trying to understand the juxtaposition in that they're both talking about differences, but they're seeing it from different viewpoints, maybe? Very much so. So the white, the white radio producers, right, wanted black people to sound like Amos and Andy, right, and assumed, who were played by white actors, by the way, most, most folks know that, on the radio show. Um, and most black actors on the radio in the 40s in particular, the few that, that were performing had scripted dialect. Often whites, um, white people coached black, black performers to speak in these ways that they then broadcast as natural black ways of speaking. So they're really, these two folks are talking about the sonic color line from two different ways. Um, the white executives are saying, yes, there's something essential about the black voice. It's deeper, it's richer, it sounds better on the radio. Um, and, and they're, and they're listening, we can only cast them in certain roles because of this. Um, but what, oh, I, I the, the things that white executives said in interviews in the 40s was um, quite horrible and, and remarkable for their, their candidness. Um, so this character, this person that um, Florinai Miller was saying, I mean, this is what we also said, what's wrong with sounding black? Like, that's exactly what he's saying, is like, I don't, in responding to the sonic color line, I don't have to then change my voice to, to erase the parts of me that sound black because I, that's how I want to sound. That's how my community sounds. It's a cultural thing. I like that I sound black, so why should I have to um, sound, like, sound exactly like the way that the white voices sound on the radio? So he was worried that um, by countering dialect with ultra, ultra proper speech, to say, hey, like we don't talk like that, we talk like this, that we're, he, we're also in, in danger of erasing, um, you know, s saying certain things, like our own sounds that we find pleasing to ourselves. And so he's coming at the sound of blackness from, from a different way, that there's nothing wrong with, sound, with sounding black. Um, it's, it's the sonic clone and it says it's lesser, that's wrong. But Florinai Miller is not looking at it from an essential point. He's looking at it from a, from a cultural standpoint, whereas the white executive is saying, yes, they sound different. We can only use them in this particular way, even though we have to script them to sound different. Um, does, that, does that make sense, that definition? Yeah, thank you very much. Good question. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh, you got me. Ah! <laughs> Right. And so who has the right to hear them, right? So on this on this question. Like who's whose account of the hearing becomes authoritative? Yes, right there. Um, I you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking about how students of color on my campus have been have been protesting about the racist environment and trying to explain to, I was at meetings where students were explaining to the president, he will not just take them on their word that it's a racist environment. He insists, because he doesn't hear it that way, that it is then not, right? His view of reality um, and his way of sensorily understanding the world is privileged as the arbiter, rather than listening to the students and, and, um, and trusting them as, as knowing their own experience um, and you create a situation where, again, like you look at, are we have a diverse campus. Many languages are spoken. The visuals look look um, look multiracial. But when it comes down to yeah, whose voice is, is who can listen, whose account is um, considered sensorially accurate, um, is still really there's just gross inequities in in that regard. Absolutely. Yes. I was going to ask though, 
and you're just you have the different categories, noisy, black, and quiet, Asian, loud, Latin, one of them too? Yes. Okay. As they like, that was the kind of the, the trope in the one day at a time sketch. Yeah. Another question is, sure. say names. What does it mean by say names? Saying names. Um, some students come to school with names that are never mispronounced. Right? Jennifer, I've never had anyone call me anything but Jennifer. Um, Amy. Um, even Aaron, with two A's, gets pronounced Aaron. Um, I know, I know you guys know where I'm going with this. <laughs> but um, if you come, um, because the, the the white names are presented as standard, and um, so you have teachers, 82% white women, that believe certain names are normal or standard. When you come to a U.S. school and you have a name that is um, like one of my students, his name is Elvis Castillo. Um, and you know, he always, he's Castillo, he's been Castillo, right? So the, hearing your name, and the teachers don't bother to even learn it. They go, oh, that name, I can't pronounce it, it's too crazy, right? So you're already displaced as someone who belongs in that space, someone who will be taught of and thought of equitably. Um, and, you know, and he was saying, he's like, well, my name is Elvis Castillo, that's closer, but that's still not how my name sounds, right? It's Elvis Castillo. And, and I never get to hear my name sounded that way. And what does it mean to, to, to not be heralded and not be called to? Um, at one of the high schools I worked at, we organized, I was a high school teacher for six years, um, the group Latinos working together, we organized to get a faculty member who could say Latino last names. Our high school was 40% Latino, but they had someone who could not pronounce Spanish surnames, um, calling out the names at graduation in front of your family, in front of, this is such an important moment, but they considered it as not even important that those students' names were pronounced correctly, just pointing out their deviation from Amy and Aaron. Um, but if you didn't grow up with those names as standard, it might be A.A. Ron, um, if you looked at it, right? And it's calling out that those names are only normal because of things like the sonic color line. Um, so, so learning how, I always spend time with my students. I pronounce it sometimes 10 times until they say that that's how they want to hear it. Um, I don't know, we often send out pictures ahead of our students. Why don't we send out recordings of students saying their name so we can practice their name before we get to class? Um, that, that matters so much. Um, so yeah, take the, when you meet people, take the time. Um, even I, I make mispronouncements as boldly because um, it's better to hear your name mispronounced boldly, I think, than to go, uh, uh, I don't know if I can say this. Oh, this one's kind of weird. Um, you know, just that pause, that um, that pause before those names signifies difference. So boldly mispronounce a name, ask someone to correct you, don't be embarrassed about it, um, and just keep going till, and then say, no, 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 I want to have a nickname. I'm like, you shouldn't have to have a nickname. If you don't want to have a nickname, um, you know, you, students go, it's this easier if you call me X. And I'm like, I don't care if it's easier. I'm, you're worth it. You're worth it being me practicing this, you know? Yeah. Don't make it easier for me. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, Thank you for coming. I saw it on Facebook as I was coming here, because I was riding. I saw it on Facebook, so I'm ready to Yes. Here's my question. <laughs> I'm sure you can hear me, because as a black man, I have those thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When I watch the news, uh, forgive my ignorance, bear with me. When I watch the news, and I see men that look like me, who I know have the bass in my black voice, as you show on the key and peel yes. clip. See, one, one thing that we as black people know coming up in this country, we know how to flip the pitch. Mm -hmm. That's something that's ingrained in us, we learn it from mm -hmm. kindergarten on up. Okay? So all of us, I'll say that generally, all of us are able to do what key and peel has done. Yes. Okay? And then when we are amongst our own, the bass may come out. And the fathers may come up. Okay. <laughs> so when it comes to white supremacy and this dynamic, as it relates to industries of music, um, the networks, 
when I see people like me that, that's on the news with the high pitched voice, <laughs> and as you relate these dynamics to, say, what happened to Philando Castile, yes. and the police dynamics that's going on with black men in the country, is that related to fear when it comes to white males that causes them to produce this science that you are highlighting in your book? Let me, let me think about this for a it, second. What you um, say is a fear, whether it's warranted or unwarranted, if it's right. done from knowledge or ignorance, is it a, is it a, a subliminal, a subconscious fear of Yes. Um, I think I think there's a lot going on there, and I think there's a there is a strand of fear, but but because of desire for authority or control, and that the fear in some ways comes from um, I think this this uh, the need to assert um, authority, right? That conditioned response that black students aren't allowed to ask questions in class and be seen as, that a black student asking a question in class is seen as disruptive rather than interested. Um, that, that white student may ask the, may ask the same question. Um, so it is a different, it's a conditioned response about how, how black people take up space or should be in space. Um, Sandra Bland, right, um, you know, talked back to the cop um, something that, that white people do very, very frequently when they get stopped and they don't have the same, um, the same fears or the same repercussions, right? That it's not illegal to talk back to a cop. It's definitely not an, an, an offense that's punishable by, by death. Um, so someone like Sandra Bland, the officer, you know, was not scared of her, but you saw this desire that she was not showing him enough compliance. She was not performing this kind of deferent listening that's been expected of black people by white people since that was set in slavery. That's why my book goes back to the 19th century, because that kind of listening, in those same slave ads, they will say things like, looks down while listening, um, or a defiance that looks, looks white people in the eye while talking. Um, they point out those those relationships of listening. So in some ways, I think there is this conditioned fear, but that's too easy. I think it's they're not getting the they're not getting the performance of white superiority that they want. Um, I think, and that they you know, and, and I think that's exactly that's exactly it. Um, I started this research. Um, I, I talked about it a little bit earlier today. I was a high school teacher for six years. One of my, one of my students in my very first English class I taught was Taisha Miller in, in Riverside. Um, she was shot 12 times by the Riverside Police Department. She was, um, she was in, her, in her car, passed out. Um, her, and her, her and her cousin had run out of gas um, and were, this was back in the days before cell phones, it was 1998. And she was on her way home from the club. It was like 3 in the morning. They were 19, having a good time. Um, she was passed out with really, really loud music playing in her car. Um, really, really loud music. Young woman. Um, she had a gun in her lap. 3 in the morning, alone in a white neighborhood. Her cousin was, was trying to find relatives to, to come help. And when, they, when her cousin got back, she was passed out and um, having a seizure. She was um, foaming at the mouth. She was shaking. Her cousin couldn't get her to, to come to, and so she called the paramedics. Um, she told the paramedics that, that Taisha had a gun, and because of that, the paramedics sent the police, and they decided, um, and again, this, this idea of fear, right, the loud music, the assumptions um, about, about her as a young woman, they um, thought they saw her move. Um, and open fire on the, the car. They were coming up to, they thought smashing the driver's side window was a good call for some reason. Um, and that was one of the things um, that, sparked, um, that sparked me to think about race and sound in this way. Um, one of my, my ex-boyfriend from high school, his cousin that I grew up with was shot in the back by the crash unit in Corona, um, at a, California, at a loud party. The loud party was an excuse that the cops used to roll up to this place their witnesses said no one ever heard them say freeze or identify themselves, and they shot. Um, so we wanted to think about how do we slow this process down? If, if it is fear, how, do, how can we recondition that? How do we get you know, this idea of 
assuming and asserting authority. I've talked with cops. I was at a um, like a round table in Ithaca. Um, it was actually a really interesting experience because the hip hop collective there, the hip hop collection sponsored it, and they played 20 minutes of hip hop referencing police. Um, while we were up there on a panel with police listening to NWA, I was, I was my stomach, it was, it was, it was, woof. Um, but, but one of the things I noticed was in all these hip hop songs, listening to them together, I was like, they all imitate, right, the same cop tone. Like, whether it's from the 90s, whether it's from the 2000s, whether it's from last week, there's this cop tone. And I asked them, I said, you know, do you hear that? Do you hear that tone that you're affecting, the way that that tone is being heard? Do you realize what that signifies? You're accusing the black men and women that you're stopping of aggression when you are clearly like broadcasting that, like maybe it's you. Um, and in fact, I think it is you. Um, and no, we don't get trained for interpersonal communication. They said we get trained, for, you know, lots of hours on the gun range, but we don't get trained in interpersonal communication, um, which is just insane to me. Um, so I've been doing a lot of research on the cop voice and where the cop voice comes from and, and uh, how we can, how we can uh, work that out. Thank you for your question and thank you for coming. Um, yes? Yes, like the tone, like it's a cadence, right? Like um, I, what really, uh, the Jay-Z, when he, um, the line where he taught the cop uh, stops him and he imitates the cop's voice for, that he stopped him for doing 55, uh, 55 and a 54, and that, you know, the content, right, is important, but the tone and that way that the, that he imitates the cop speaking to him. Like how, and I, and I kind of look at those hip hop songs as like, this is how I hear you. This is how you sound to me. Um, and so thinking about what is behind that, that tone and what it communicates um, and how it often sets up a hierarchical relationship before um, anyone else gets to speak. And when that, that is threatened, um, that that's when it sets off um, when often when, when these white officers shoot and kill, a lot of it has to do with that, that perceived challenge to that authoritative tone. Yeah. Yes? Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you for coming and like, sharing for your book and um, your personal experience and why you started this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, guys. It's been wonderful. We'll be signing books. If you want me to sign books, you just want to say hey. Um, and really, thank you for coming out. There are many other things to do on this lovely, warm. I live in upstate New York, so this is warm to me. <laughs> this lovely, warm afternoon. Um, I very much appreciate it. Thanks again. And there's food. Woo! Hey! Thank you. Oh, that is just. Oh, you have great students.